Though nearly 20 years have passed since the standalone version of Extreme Championship Wrestling last promoted a show, their influence has not been extinguished. Chants of the promotion's initials can sometimes be heard in other promotions for moments that are, well, extreme. Familiar faces from ECW's colourful lifetime still dot the modern landscape, and attempts have been made to create new versions of ECW as indies have tried to co-opt the unique renegade spirit that defined the Philadelphia-based company. And that renegade spirit made itself heard one night in August of 1994, when ECW declared extreme independence, while standing on the neck of a wheezing, dying entity. It remains one of wrestling's most controversial and historic double-crosses. The ECW way, as most fans know it, is chock full of specific ingredients. Painful weaponry, routine bloodshed, scantily clad women, and rampant profanity. Dig a little deeper into core ECW and you'd also find the finest in-ring technicians and daredevils showcasing their wares, as well as mainstream cast-offs taking the opportunity to profoundly reinvent themselves. When ECW ran its first show in 1992, few of those elements were evident, because ECW was once a much different ball of wax. In February of 1992, ECW ran its first event at a Philadelphia sports bar on a Tuesday night. The card was filled with local notables including DC Drake, Johnny Hotbody, Tony Stetson, and Glenn Osborne, as well as former WWF champion Ivan Koloff and a 20-year-old eventual mainstay in Stevie Richards. This promotion wasn't extreme yet, neither in mantra nor in name. At the time, ECW stood for Eastern Championship Wrestling and it operated under the promotional eye of Philadelphia businessman Todd Gordon. The company was actually a spiritual continuation of a local entity called the Tri-State Wrestling Alliance, which ran out of Philly from 1989 to 1992. The short-lived promotion gained a measure of fame for some of the eclectic dream matches it promoted, including a famed three-match hardcore showcase between Cactus Jack and Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert in 1991. But mounting debt sealed Tri-State's fate. Gordon picked up the pieces and carried on with ECW. Industrial stars including Superfly Jimmy Snooker, Don Morocco, Kerry Von Erich and Davey Boy Smith all appeared for the young promotion during its first year. And by the spring of 1993, ECW secured a local TV deal on Sports Channel Philadelphia. Shortly after, a freight warehouse on the corner of Swanson and Rittner Streets in South Philly was repurposed as the ECW Arena. And that same year, a former WCW personality entered the ECW fold, one that would become synonymous with the organization. Manager Paul E. Dangerously, or Paul Heyman if you prefer. Though he'd one day become the brains of the outfit, Heyman's time with ECW didn't initially situate him on top of the company totem pole. At the time, he was there to help out wherever needed, assisting the aforementioned Gilbert who booked the company in addition to performing as one of its top stars. And besides, Heyman already had a booking gig. Veteran wrestling promoter Jim Crockett Jr. had just re-entered the business with a startup called the NWA-affiliated World Wrestling Network, and tabbed Heyman as his booker. Heyman looked to split his time between the two entities, booking for Crockett and working for ECW on a peripheral basis. But Gilbert wouldn't be long for the promotion, and many factors seemed to contribute to his exit. He and then-friend Heyman apparently quarrelled over direction, as Heyman wanted to take chances and innovate, whereas Hot Stuff was said to be a bit more traditionally minded. Others feel that Heyman, despite booking for Crockett, wanted to be the top dog in ECW, and that a power play may have aided Gilbert's departure. Another factor was the connection between ECW and Crockett's WWN, which reportedly irked Gilbert to no end. As was noted in the book Hardcore History, Gilbert had been less than enamoured with Crockett since 1987, when Crockett bought Bill Watts' UWF group and promptly allowed most of its stars to be booked into oblivion. One of those stars, you may have guessed, was Gilbert himself. In September 1993, Crockett and the National Wrestling Alliance welcomed ECW to its list of membership promotions, with Heyman himself present at the annual NWA convention. Certainly, the NWA needed fresh blood. 
That same month, Ted Turner's World Championship Wrestling officially withdrew from the National Wrestling Alliance, which had been dwindling in power and scope anyway. But there were ambitions on making the NWA a powerhouse again, and gaining a respectable foothold in the Northeastern US, especially a foothold that had a regional TV deal, was an ideal play. While Gordon was looking forward to promoting the Northeast under Crockett, this arrangement was not music to Gilbert's ears. Needing a new booker, Gordon turned to Heyman. When Paul E. gained control of the book, he already had at his disposal an ideal champion in 28-year-old Shane Douglas. After leaving WCW on a sour note earlier that year, Douglas had been coaxed to ECW by Gilbert in the summer of 1993, where the longtime bright-eyed babyface began working as a heel. Contrasting Douglas's choir boy good looks was a natural sounding devilish growl that would underscore his many ECW soliloquies to come. After previous ECW champion Tito Santana failed to appear for a title defense, Douglas was awarded the strap via forfeit. Though he lost the title to Sabu a few weeks later, Douglas eventually regained the gold in March of 1994 after defeating the legendary Terry Funk in an eight-man Ultimate Jeopardy match. More than a month prior, Douglas cemented himself as the lead heel ECW needed, following an impassioned promo that came after his inability to win the title from Funk in a three-way match that also included Sabu. It was here that Douglas found his voice as the franchise, a no-frills, salt-of-the-earth athlete that thought highly of himself, mixing pomposity with athletic grit. In other words, the bad guy that you loved to hate. While Douglas continued his entrenchment as the most effective heel outside of North America's Big Two, Heyman's relationship with Crockett was disintegrating. The World Wrestling Network ran what was ultimately its only TV taping in February of 1994 at New York's Manhattan Center. In addition to a bevy of ECW talents, the tapings were also attended by stars like Road Warrior Hawk, Jake the Snake Roberts, and Missy Hyatt. The original plan was for ECW to become an arm on the WWN body, to be a launching pad for local talents to get ready for the big time that Crockett's group intended to become. But a combination of ECW developing a cult following for its wholly unique product and Heyman's clashes with Crockett over direction and tastes led to Heyman severing ties with WWN. Gordon was also in favor of keeping ECW from becoming too deeply associated with the World Wrestling Network, maintaining some degree of independence. But ECW was still very much part of the NWA, the biggest fish in the decidedly small pond that the NWA governed over. In fact, when the NWA board decided it was time to crown a brand new NWA World Heavyweight Champion in 1994, it was determined to have ECW be the battleground for the all-important tournament. And this did not sit well with New Jersey-based promoter Dennis Coraluzzo, who was one of the NWA's joint presidents. Coraluzzo felt uncomfortable with the tournament being awarded solely to ECW, feeling that one promotion was earning favoritism over the other NWA affiliates. He didn't want one affiliate gaining virtual control of the NWA world title, as had been the case when Crockett oversaw WCW in the 80s. Coraluzzo believed that the tournament being held strictly in ECW was a sign that that was going to happen once more. This understandably created friction between Coraluzzo and ECW, especially when Coraluzzo made it clear that he was going to oversee the entire tournament personally, even though it was taking place on ECW's turf. Heyman later claimed that Coraluzzo had done his best to try and sabotage ECW's shows out of envy, as the Philly events were vastly outdrawing Coraluzzo's cards across state lines in New Jersey. He even said that Coraluzzo would call the Philadelphia Fire Department under the guise of being a local resident, saying that ECW was violating the fire code with an overcrowded building, resulting in the local fire department performing head counts and checking the sprinkler systems before any events could go on as planned. In February of 1994, on the same night Douglas battled Funk and Sabu in that famed three-way match in Philadelphia, Coraluzzo ran his own event less than 20 miles away, just over the bridge in Clementon, New Jersey, with Jerry Lawler headlining against Abdullah the Butcher. In response, after the first match of the ECW card, which drew 1,300 fans due to the 500 across the river, Heyman went on a verbal tirade in reference to the opposition show, in particular about the use of Jerry Lawler, who was facing very serious legal issues at the time. Nonetheless, ECW was getting the tournament to be held in Philadelphia on Saturday night, August 27th, 1994. The participants included Douglas, Taz, Two Cold Scorpio, Dean Malenko, Chris Benoit, Osamu Nishimura, Heyman's on-screen bodyguard 911, and the Matt Bourne version of Doink the Clown. 
The NWA board decided to put the championship on reigning champion Douglas, but it wasn't a unanimous decision. Coraluzo and NWA attorney Bob Trobich argued for Benoit to win the championship. So in order to get Coraluzo's blessing for Douglas, Gordon agreed that Douglas would eventually lose the title to Benoit at a later date. While some board members filed away the notion of that Douglas Benoit title match, Gordon and Heyman knew that it was never going to happen. At some point before the tournament, Gordon and Heyman met with Douglas to lay out a bit of a plan. The promoter and booker decided that if Coraluzo and the NWA were going to meddle to such a degree, then they no longer wished to be associated with the alliance. But rather than simply bow out gracefully, they were going to make a show of their exit, and they were going to draw a few headlines in the process. Heyman presented the plan to Douglas. Upon winning the tournament and giving his victory speech, Douglas would publicly disavow the NWA title, refusing to carry the near 50-year-old championship. He would then extol the virtues of ECW, declaring himself the champion not only of the young promotion, but of a new movement in the wrestling industry. In short, Douglas was asked to do something radical and revolutionary that could very well backfire on him and his bosses. Understandably, the franchise had reservations about doing what he was asked. For many reasons, Douglas was conflicted, but it was Coraluzo, for whom Douglas was not the ideal choice of champion, that made his decision for him. Three days before the tournament, Coraluzo appeared on the radio show of Mike Tanay. As Douglas remembers, Coraluzo buried him as unreliable during the interview, claiming Douglas was the type to take a promoter's money and then no show an event. Douglas not only denies that claim, but says at the time that he'd never even met Coraluzo or dealt with him on a personal level. It mystified him as to why Coraluzo chose to run his name through the mud three days before the tournament in which Douglas was about to become his organization's top champion. Douglas was now leaning more heavily toward desecrating the NWA title per Heyman's proposal, but even then, he knew he was going to be the focal point of a hefty promotional gamble. And so the tournament began inside the overheated ECW arena. Douglas defeated Taz in the first round while Malenko forced Nishimura to submit, 911 squashed Doink, and Scorpio defeated Benoit in an instant classic. In the semis, Douglas outlasted Malenko, while Scorpio defeated the larger 911 via countout. Douglas then met Scorpio in the anticipated final match, and pinned the high flyer with his variation of the belly to belly suplex. As Douglas admitted later, even during the tournament final, he hadn't officially made up his mind about refusing the NWA belt in the aftermath. But he had to make a decision, and he had to make it quick. With Coraluzo, Heyman, Gordon, and an arena filled with ECW revelers looking on, a winded, weary Douglas went into his acceptance speech, where he began rattling off all of those impressive names that held the title before him. He mentioned Lou Thez, Jack Briscoe, both Funk Brothers, Buddy Rogers, Harley Race, Barry Windham, Dusty Rhodes, Kerry Von Erich, Ricky Steamboat, and with a snide chuckle, a man he didn't particularly care for in Ric Flair. In a later interview, Douglas noted that he listed off the names in part because he was stalling, still going back and forth in his head about what he was going to do. He hailed the legendary names, looked up to the heavens to his father, and complimented the championship's physical beauty. Then, as he remembers it, he briefly made eye contact with Coraluzo, who was sitting ringside near Gordon, and thought back to that hatchet job interview with Mike Tanay. That's when Douglas's tone grew coarse as he rasped, and they can all kiss my ass. As he delivered that final word, Douglas dismissively sent the NWA title belt tumbling to the canvas. After a moment of mild commotion and confusion, Douglas continued what was now an impassioned tirade, saying he refused to accept the torch of a promotion that, in his words, died R.I.P. seven years ago. He then declared himself the man who ignites the new flame of the sport of professional wrestling. Douglas then personally affirmed ECW's title as an official world championship, while declaring a new era for the sport, for himself, and for ECW, while the arena goers applauded this unexpected turn of events. Meanwhile, Coraluzo was understandably livid at what just transpired. Heyman and Gordon reportedly tried to tell him that Douglas's actions were all an angle to enhance Douglas as a heel, but of course, that was not true. Coraluzo called Douglas's actions a disgrace and claimed that since the double cross occurred in NWA's jurisdiction, he would seek to have Douglas stripped of both the NWA and ECW titles. 
Douglas had already abdicated the NWA belt with his emphatic throwdown, so that was of no issue to anyone in ECW anyway. But as for the ECW title, well, the promotion wasn't going to operate under the NWA's banner for much longer. Gordon delivered a speech on ECW television days later, declaring that he had folded NWA Eastern Championship Wrestling earlier that day in favour of his new venture, Extreme Championship Wrestling, and the promotion officially recognised Douglas as its World Heavyweight Champion. From there, ECW continued to thrive as a cult-centric revolution. Through imaginative storylines, chaotic brawls, the pitting of world-class talents against each other, and its general permeating sense of rebellion. The NWA, by obvious contrast, had egg on their face following the debacle. They booked another tournament to crown a new champion three months later as part of a joint effort between Coraluzo's New Jersey outfit and Jim Cornette's Smoky Mountain Wrestling. This time, it was Chris Candido who came away with the gold, defeating Tracy Smothers in the final match. In the decades since, earnest attempts have been made to legitimise the NWA and its world title, whether it was a national connection to the Jarrett's total non-stop action enterprise, or a connection with Ring of Honor, or the latter-day Billy Corgan-operated venture with the studio wrestling revival, the acclaimed Ten Pounds of Gold series, and a proud champion in Nick Aldis. In the spring of 1995, Gordon sold his ownership stakes of ECW to Heyman. He remained the on-screen authority figurehead until he exited the company in the summer of 1997. Around the time Heyman bought Gordon out, Douglas had dropped the ECW title to the Sandman and was preparing for a jump to the WWF, a move that he would come to regret. By early 1996, Douglas was back in ECW and reigned twice more as its world champion before departing once again in 1999. According to Jim Cornette, he agreed to do a surprise run-in at an ECW event in 1997 on the condition that Heyman made amends with Coraluzo. Allegedly, after the three dined together, Heyman apologised to Coraluzo and said he'd allow his ECW wrestlers to work his shows, which Heyman reportedly denied ever agreeing to. Coraluzo had stepped down as NWA president about a year after the throwdown incident, but remained a part of the organization through the late 90s, while continuing to promote events in the New Jersey area. On a sad note, however, unfortunately, in July of 2001, Dennis Coraluzo passed away from a brain hemorrhage at the age of 48. More than a quarter century has passed since the historic ECW NWA double cross, and without it, we may have never experienced the ECW we'd come to know, the highly influential, for reasons both good and bad, organization that broke all of the rules, inspiring larger companies to change up their own time-tested playbooks. And it's daunting to imagine how different wrestling today might be without all of this happening. When you stop and consider ECW's wide-reaching influence, how different are things if Heyman, Gordon, and ultimately Douglas chose to go along with the NWA and Coraluzo? To create a mushroom cloud of that magnitude, the conspirators in ECW had to renege on agreements, hurt some feelings, flout tradition, and risk burning bridges without a safety net in place. And yet, in the cutthroat world of professional wrestling, it somehow almost feels like business as usual.